the last chapter in uh, conduction heat transfer. We'll be starting probably, we'll finish up Friday. We'll probably start radiation heat transfer on Monday of next week, chapter 12. Chapter 5, everything we had so far, pretty much, except for some graphing we did, pretty much was steady state. Well, chapter 5 says, all right, now let's let things vary with time. And you can see the differential equation there, the general one for 1D transient induction, no generation, uh, constant properties. This one, 1D, piece of function that's only, no generation, Q dot zero. The constant properties, if K comes outside the second partial, divided through by K, gives you alpha. But it's not steady state, it's transient. Temperature, in general, is a function of a coordinate like x, or maybe the radius r, and time t. There's a couple ways to solve these problems. If you're lucky, there's an easy way, and then if you're not, you have to do it the harder way. Okay, the easy way. The easy way is a simple model. Here's what we're doing. We're taking some object at a certain temperature, let's say it starts out hot, just to talk about it. It starts out hot. We blow a cold fluid over it. Maybe it's air. Let's just say air. We blow air over it. There's a convection coefficient on the outside surface. The object starts to cool. It starts to cool, and the longer you wait, the cooler this object gets. But the assumption we make is that the temperature is not a function of x on that picture. It's only a function of time. At any, at any particular time, the temperature on the surface is the same as the temperature in the middle, is the same as the temperature anywhere else in the body. Temperature is only a function of time, not of x in this particular model. If that's the case, I'm going to tell you when it's appropriate to use it. If that's the case, this simple model is called the lump heat capacity model. That makes life a lot easier for us. That's true. And by the way, just so we know, uh, at time equals zero, we're going to say the temperature is Ti, initial temperature. So that is our initial condition. At time equals zero, the temperature is Ti. We can go back to chapter one, control volume around that. We have E dot in minus E dot out plus E dot gen equal E dot storage to change storage. Okay, for this particular situation, I said there's no generation. We're going to assume that the object starts out hot, Ti is a high number, and T infinity is cooler, a lower temperature. So in this case, it's going to be cooling with time. We could flip flop it around. We get the same, same derivation. Doesn't matter which way you go. So heat. This is hot. That's cold. Heat's going out. Heat's not coming in. Zero. This is by convection. Minus H A S. AS is the surface area. The volume of this is capital B. HAS and our temperature T minus T infinity. Equal storage M C sub P delta T. The mass is the density times the volume. Specific heat, dt, d time. Okay. Um, let's just check the units to see what comes out. We know this side is going to be in watts. We've done that many, many times. So we know this side is in watts. Let's check this guy. 
kilograms per cubic meter times cubic meter times joule per kilogram degree K times degree K per second. Cancel, 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 cancel. Yeah, joule per second. Yes, it is a lot. Left-hand side units equal right-hand side. But it's always a good thing to do to check it and make sure you got it okay. Okay, so we know that equation makes dimensional sense. Let me erase that now. All right, now we clean the equation up as we talked about before. Step one, clean it up. To do that, I'm going to go through a change in variable. A new variable theta is t minus t infinity. Uh, if you see the term theta i, it's t i minus t infinity. If you do this, it gives this guy over here is theta. This is d theta dt. And this is equal to uh, minus H A S rho C B times theta. So there's the cleaned up differential equation. condition when time equals zero, theta equals theta i. Solution gives theta over theta i. size dimensionless temperature over temperature difference temperature difference divided by temperature difference we can then plot this where we'll plot time on the x-axis and we'll plot theta over theta i on the y-axis when time equals zero theta over theta i is one it's exponential so it looks something like this For different values, it looks like this, and these values are something we call the time constant tau. Time constant tau is here, rho c v divided by h a s. The units are going to be in seconds or hours, minutes, seconds, or hours. I'll put down here seconds. In, uh, in SI, they're pretty much always in seconds. That's why it's, it's called the time constant. So, if you would rather, you could also express this in totally dimensionless form.
tau is increasing as you go that way on the parametric value of the curves. Like the Moody chart. Same thing. We know the relative roughness goes up as you go up on the Moody chart. Okay. Uh, this is a low value of tau. How do you get a low value of tau? Um, let, let's make, probably make more common sense to take a high value. Take a high value of tau. How do you get a high value of that portion? Well, one way is multiplying the density by the volume is the mass. Okay, so the numerator has mass in it. If I've got a small copper sphere the size of a ping pong ball and a big copper sphere the size of a basketball, which one do you think is going to cool faster? <laughs> There's no doubt. The small one. The big one cools slower. Sure. Sure. So the mass is up here. If it's more massive, tau is up here. If it's more massive, it cools at a slower rate. If the mass is small, tau is small, a ball bearing size copper sphere, oh yeah, it cools real fast in that airstream. How about H? If H is small, tau is big. This curve is H small. What does that mean? That means there's not much air blowing over it and not very fast. Oh yeah, it's going to cool slow then. You want it to cool faster? Put a fan on it. Oh yeah, H goes up big and now tau goes down. There's what the fan does, the cooling, the copper sphere. So yes, it does make common sense. I'm saying it to you. Okay, so that's, that's our equation. It's pretty straightforward. Now, I know in some classes you've talk, maybe talked about time constants, but just you know, so you know, the time constant can tell us several things. Uh, number one, uh, after uh, at a time t equal tau, the process is 63.2 percent complete. At time equal five time constants, process is 99.3 percent complete. This is percent. One rule of thumb we engineers use: Let's say you've got a thermocouple, which can be modeled as a first-order system like this, a thermocouple. If I put the thermocouple, and I want to know the temperature of that wall. If I put the thermocouple on that wall, how long should I wait before I read my digital output meter? And the rule of thumb is, it's almost complete if you wait, how long? Five times the time constant. I put a, a, a surface temperature sensor on my skin. How long should I wait to read the digital output? Well, the rule of thumb is, Wait at least five time constants. Give me 99% of the way there's the true value of the temperature of my skin. So that's how we engineers use the time constant sometimes. It gives us a, it gives us a ballpark figure, how long to wait to measure something experimentally. Okay, uh, so that's what that is. Now, of course, the, uh, the question is, when can we use this simple model called the lumped heat capacity model? Okay, so this model can be used When Vi the B O number H L C over K one tenth. So first of all you calculate a dimensionless number. Call the B O number. There's going to be a ton of dimensionless numbers in uh, ME 415, wait until chapter 6, 7, and 8 in convection. Probably 20 dimensionless numbers at least. In, in, in fluids, you had uh, quite a few already. You know, the Mach number, the Reynolds number, the Struhl number, the Fruit number. It goes on and on. There's probably six or eight or ten you can in fluid mechanics. In heat transfer, there's more in heat transfer. We engineer love dimensionless numbers. We're just in love with them. 
we try and do somewhat with the measurements numbers because they're so useful to us. If you want to plot this guy versus T over tau, there it is. How many lines are there? One. Does it cover pretty much everything? All values of H, A, S, B, C, rho? Yes, it does. That's why we love it. It uh, correlates data. Is there a Moody graph for water? No. A Moody graph for a one-inch pipe? No. A Moody graph for a velocity of 15 feet per second? No. One graph covers everything. And, and why is that? Because we plot it on dimensionless parameters, the friction factor F versus Reynolds number R. And the parametric value is epsilon over D, the relative roughness. That's, that's a classic dimensionless graph like this. That's why we love them. I don't have 5,000 pages of Moody graphs. One page, one sheet of paper, covers every fluid, every pipe diameter, every velocity. Wow, is that valuable? Yes, Mr. Moody, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing, we love these dimensionless numbers. Okay, back to here. So that's the rule now. Uh, let's see how we get this thing called L sub C. Now, we have to shift gears. We're no longer in chapter three for fins. In chapter three for fins, L sub C stood for the corrected finling. No, no, this is chapter five. Now L sub C stands for a, a characteristic dimension. <clears throat> the characteristic dimension is the volume divided by the surface area. There's a table in the uh, book, I'll just summarize it here, which gives different values for that. So if we have uh, let's put down the geometry. L sub C. This is a table in the book, I forget what number it is, 5, 1 probably. Geometry of sphere. Uh, this is a D over 6 or R naught over 3. Um, R naught is the radius. If it's a cylinder, a long cylinder, R0 is the radius, R0 over 2. If it's a plane wall, 2L thick, L sub C equal L, the half wall thickness. I'll draw a picture of the wall so you know what it's like. And when we do that, I'll just show you how you do it. Um, maybe I'll wait and do the example problem and show you there. Yeah, I think I will. I'll come back to this in a minute then. Okay, so that goes up here in the BO number to check for that. And I say, well, what if the BO number is greater than 0.1? Well, I hope you can come back Friday, because I'll tell you on Friday, okay? It's, it's, it's the long and complicated way. This is a, this is a short and easy way. 
If it's less than 110, then this method is pretty good. It gets us pretty close. Not perfect, but close enough for most, most applications. All right, so we're going to use this now, this simple model, for a problem of a small copper sphere. So, this is an example. A one-eighth inch copper sphere. Uh, for copper, uh, we have a density is uh, 216. C, specific heat. Rho, density. Specific heat. diameter. Okay. We have a fluid blowing over the sphere, T infinity, with H on the outside of the sphere. H is 2. Uh, this is air blowing over the outside. T infinity is a uh, Zero is a T infinity is 100 degrees C. The initial temperature of the copper sphere is um, 300 degrees. And we're asked to uh, plot T versus time graph. Okay, uh, obviously, uh, first thing to do, we better see if we can use an easy way out. BO number. So, BO number, I need LC. LC equal the volume of a sphere divided by its surface area. The volume, pi d cubed divided by 6. The surface area, pi d squared. I, hmm? I know you cancel, you cancel stuff, but like, did you just put the uh, geometry up there for LC? I'm sorry? Sure. Okay. Sure. All right. You don't want to do that. Because the answer I get now better be that guy. You don't have to do it. If it's a sphere, you can pick it off right here. L sub C is R naught over 3, R D over 6. D is 2 times R naught, so R naught over 3. We just proved that right there. There it is. There it is. You want to prove the other ones? Okay. Let's do the long cylinder. Long cylinder. <coughs> D. Okay. L sub C equal volume over surface area. Volume, pi d squared uh, L, pi d squared over 4, L, divided by the surface area, uh, pi d, here's the surface area, pi d times L. Cancel, 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 cancel. D over 4, which is R naught over 2. Yeah, there it is. Plain wall. You want to do that? I don't know if you do the plain wall. You say, whoa, wait a minute. 
you didn't include this area for convection, for surface area. No, I didn't, because there's a magic word here. And magic word is long. There are no ends. Long means ignore the ends. <coughs> ignore the ends. It's long. Plain wall. Volume. Surface area times 2L. The area of the outside. Here's the area of A. Here's the area of A. 2 times A. Okay, so the, the volume is A times 2L. Uh, the um, uh, surface area, left hand side, right hand side, each area is A. Left hand side, right hand side, 2A. Cancel, 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 cancel. Yep, it's just L. It's just L. There it is right there. L. So that's how you get those three things. Plus, the general rule is if you want to find L sub C for any shape, Here's what you do. Take the volume divided by the surface area. Just as another quick example. Let's say you've got a little cube of copper. And it's A by A by A. L sub C is the volume. A cubed. Divided by the surface area. 6A squared. Cancel, cancel. A over 6. No matter what it is, that's how you get L sub C. Why are these three things so important? Well, because we engineers use them a lot. If you want some examples, I'll give you three specific examples. If you're going to heat treat ball bearings in a furnace, how long should they be in there until the outside of the ball bearing is hardened? Ball bearing's hardened. How long should I keep that in there? We need, we need this guy. That's a ball bearing. If I have 3 16 inch wire on a spool. How many feet are on that spool? I don't know. 200 feet. How big is the, is, is the diameter? Oh, let's just say a quarter inch. Is that a long cylinder? Sure, a wire is a long cylinder. You put that wire through a furnace. How long should it be, should it be in there to heat treat that? How long should it be in that furnace? How fast should that wire go through the furnace? The speed. So when it comes out that end over there, it's been heat treated. That's wire. Oh, a plain wall. You want to heat treat a slab of steel one inch thick in a furnace. Yeah, there it is. Slab of steel, convection on both sides, comes in hot, gets hotter as it's heat treated. So yeah, these are common things that occur in engineering, whether they're ball bearing, wire, or maybe a slab of steel being heat treated. That's why they're listed in this table. But the other ones, you can get them yourself. I had it over here. Okay, so back over here, uh, we got this guy. And let's get the VO number now. VO number is equal to HLC over K. HLC over K. H is 2. Uh, L is uh, uh, R naught is a diameter over 6. The diameter is 1 eighth inch divided by 12. Divided by 6. Okay, divided by K for, for uh, copper 216. So if I do that, I end up with a VO number of uh, three zeros, 121. That's a lot less than 110. So it's okay to use lump T capacity. All right, so here we go. There's the equation. Uh, let's skip, we have to get our H A now. Let's just calculate that uh, rho C B time constant. Heat 
V over A S is L sub C. There it is. 1 8 divided by 12 divided by 6. H to time constant. 0 0.0092 hours. The answer comes out to be in hours because hours is on the properties over there in English, which is a little more than half a minute. Uh, which is about 33 seconds. So there's a time constant. That goes up here, minus T, we'll put it in hours, uh, minutes, I'm sorry, minutes, uh, 0.55. T is in minutes, temperature is in degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> Now we're going to uh, plot it. I need some space for that. So I'm going to plot it here. Okay, we're going to plot temperature versus time. And I'll do this for, I think I did for five minutes. Four minutes. One. Two, three, four, and we start out. It said at three hundred T initial, and here is uh, 100, uh, 200, 250, 150, 50. So here is one hundred the air temperature. If I plot it, oh, let's see what I get here. After one minute, I'm at about 130. One minute, I'm at about 130. There's 150, 130 is right there. Two minutes, oh, I'm right down there at about 110. 110 right there. So now I start out at 300. So if I would plot that, it would look something like this. So there's the plot of how the temperature of the copper sphere varies with time. If you say, what's the temperature of the copper sphere after one time constant? After time equal to one time constant. Okay, 0.55 minutes. 0.55 minutes. What's the temperature of the copper sphere? Plug in the equation. You would um, get an air 173.6. Wait for five time constants. Five time constants. That's the engineer rule of thumb. If you want to wait, wait five time constants. Five times 0.55. Here's a five time constant out here. So 5, 25, 25, 27. All right, that's minus 2.75 minutes out here. This is a five time constant. The temperature at that particular point, F5, is uh, 100. Oh, let's see. I actually didn't get that, but you can get that. It's very, very close. Well, I can tell you what it is. It's a 90, what, 99 percent. What's the difference here? 200, 99 percent. Add two degrees. It's about 102. It's about 102. That's really close to the air temperature now. If I wait five time constants, I'm all, that copper sphere is almost at the air temperature. It's, it's within two degrees of the air temperature. That's the rule of thumb for five time constants. Okay, so there's the plot. Um, if I change anything, the rules can change. Let's say I, I, I double the diameter now to, to a quarter inch, a quarter inch, a 
quarter inch, double the diameter. Where's the diameter? Right here. Where's the uh, diameter on the, the BO number? Right here. Okay. Is the uh, BO number still okay? Okay, double that number. Oh, yeah, still okay. Still okay. I can still use one heat capacity. What do I change in that graph? What changes is I change tau. Double it. Now tau, 0 0.0184. 0 0.0184. Don't forget, the bigger the tau value, the curves go up. So the new curve now looks like this. Double, double the uh, diameter. Say, so, well, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to uh, double the H. I'm going to double H. Okay, go ahead and double H. It's still way too long. I can still use long T capacity. I go over here. What changes? I double H. If I increase the denominator, the quotient becomes smaller. Tau is smaller. Remember the curves. Tau goes, gets bigger, curves go up. Tau gets smaller, curves go down. So now my curve looks like this. This is double H. Of course it cools faster as you turn the fan on. That makes common sense. Sure, it makes common sense that way. If you make it more massive, sure it's going to cool slower. So these aren't surprises. They're somewhat common sense. Okay, now I change the material. I go to uh, in the back of the book, hard rubber. I do that, my VO number. 261, voila. <coughs> I cannot use lump heat capacity now. I've got to use the more difficult approach we're going to look at Friday. So, if any of those things can change, but H can change, K can change, timer can change, C can change, Rho can change. So, everyone's different. There's different curves on here depending on what you put in those numbers right there. Now, if you want to find the heat transfer that's taking place uh, in that time, we can do that. Let's see where our heat transfer there it is. I'm going to put that over here. Because this gives us temperature. Don't forget, a heat transfer, we're interested in two things. We're interested in the heat rate, Q, and the temperature, T. Okay, so far. Heat transfer. Q is equal to integral zero to T. H A S theta times dt. This is convection, of course. H A T minus T infinity. Integrated over a time interval, zero to t. This guy right here is in watts, H A delta t. What's a watt? A joule per second. Multiply that by time in seconds, and what do you get? You get joules. That's why it's a capital Q. This is a lowercase q. What's that in? That's in watts. This is a capital Q. What's that in? That's joules. Like thermal. Capital Q is in the thermal text. And it's in BTU per hour or joules. BTU. Okay. Um, put that guy in a box. Put him in here. Integrate it. And you end up with Q. equations. Uh, one gives the uh, temperature at any time, and the other one gives the amount of heat 
that's been transferred over that time in joules. In joules. Theta i is ti minus t infinity. Okay, so we'll. I'm going to pass out the special computer problem now. Uh, but we'll pick this up again on Friday and we'll say, what if the BO number is greater than 0.1? And we'll go through that on Friday. If you came in late, I mentioned, don't look at Blackboard for homework due dates. I'm going to change it tonight. But just so you know, Chapter 4 is due Monday. A special problem, computer problems due Wednesday. <coughs> next Friday, a week from this Friday, is Chapter 5 homework. So three things due next week. Okay, so let's go through the uh, computer problem. This is from chapter four. Okay, so your problem is we've got a fin attached to a uh, wall. T base, T infinity, <coughs> convection coefficient H on the surface. temperature of the base, we know the temperature of this air, air stream, we know the convection coefficient, we know the fin has a length of 4 centimeters and a thickness of 2, so 4 centimeters, here's L coming out, the thickness here is 2, I'm going to put on my head here, 2 is this dimension, 4 is that dimension, we're supposed to model that by a uh, nodes and heat conducting rods, so, all right, we're going to tell you what delta x and delta y are one centimeter. So it looks like this. So there's two, and this is four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, yeah. So I'll draw the model for you here. Okay. 15 nodes. So part A, find out how many nodes have an unknown temperature and write a nodal equation for each one of those nodes. So you go to the table in chapter 4. Uh, for instance, the node where my finger is right now, that's a node on a convection boundary. That's in the table. A node on a plane boundary where my finger is. That's a node on a corner convection boundary. Corner, plane wall, plane wall. So, <coughs> look at that table. Take out the right equation. <coughs> Put the numbers in and write it down. So you'll have all the equations under part A listed with numbers where you can find those. Those will be a, a function of all the temperatures, T2, T3, T4, T5, so on and so forth. B. Solve those equations for the unknown temperatures. We did this in class as a model a couple of classmates ago. Use what I did in class as a model for how you work this problem. If, I'll, I'll make something up. If you've got nine unknown temperatures, and there's not this problem. If you've got nine unknown temperatures, there'll be nine equations for those temperatures. Solve those nine equations by whatever method you want. Excel, MATLAB. Your TI, anything above a TI 10 probably can do it for you. Okay. Um, the solver function on the TI, 
are make your version, take your choice. If you do it by Excel or MATLAB, attach to your problem the hard copy printout. The hard copy printout. If you do it by your TI, I'll see you in my office in the next two weeks after you turn it in and you'll show me on the TI what you did. You might want to save those equations if you do solve them. Save it because you'll need to bring it by my office for your TI and you punch this stuff in. I look at it and see if that's what you got on the paper. If you do it by Excel or MATLAB, a hard copy attached to it is fine. After you've done that, you find what the tip temperature is, the average. See, there's three. One, two, three. Here's the thin tip. Three temperatures. Average them, part C. Compare that to <coughs> table 3, 4 in your textbook because table 3, 4 is chapter 3, and chapter 3 is one dimensional heat transfer. Temperature is only a function of X. In this problem from chapter 4, it's a 2D problem. Temperature is a function of X and Y. Part D, find the heat transfer from the fin and compare that to chapter 3 results, one dimensional heat transfer. Okay, how do you find, now we've already found the temperatures, okay. How do you find the heat transfer? Okay, uh, to find the uh, heat transfer, you see your class notes from uh, that one we did in class in chapter uh, 4, the very last part of chapter 4. I'm going back, there we go, right here. Here's what we had, the problem we worked in class in chapter 4. We had, this was a plate, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, okay. It looked like this. This side was adiabatic, perfectly insulated. This side was at zero degrees. This side was at 100 degrees. This side was at 100 degrees. Okay. If somebody, now we didn't do this at that time. If somebody, we did, we did solve for the unknown temperature. There were three of them. Okay. If you've been asked to find the heat transfer, here's one way you would do it. Okay. To find the heat transfer, number one is I'm going to find out how much heat is conducted into the zero degree phase from the inside. Inside's hot, this is cold. Heat's conducted from the inside to the zero degree phase. Q going out to the zero degree phase. Look at the heat conducting rods that connect the surface to the interior are at different temperature. Temperature here, temperature here, temperature here, temperature here, temperature here, temperature here. Temperature here. Temperature here. They are. Let's number them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Q, hot is 5, cold is 4. Q, 5 to 4. Plus Q, 8 to 7. Plus Q, 11 to 10. Use Fourier's law, Q equal K A delta T over delta X, simple model. Okay, I'm going to go from 5 to 4. If I do it by these finite uh, elements, then this is the heat that goes from 5 to 4. It's in this region right here. 5 to 4, it goes out like that. That's the heat conductor. Replacing the actual material. What's the area the heat goes through? My hand, delta Y times 1. Okay, here it is. Area is delta Y times 1. Temperature difference, hot minus cold, P5 minus T4. Divided by how far I moved. How far I moved from 5 to 4, delta X. The heat from 8 to 7. Thank you, I'll draw the picture again. The area, delta Y times 1. 
Temperature difference, 8 minus 7. Distance I moved, delta x. Plus, 11 and 10, be careful. The area now is only half an area. Half an area. Delta y over 2. Hot temperature, T11. Cold temperature, T10. Distance I move, delta x. Rectangle, or square grid, square grid, delta y equal delta x. Gone, 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 gone. I've got it. I've solved all, all the temperatures in the previous problem. Part C, I solved the temperatures. There they are. <clears throat> now, that's one way to do it. You can also do it this way. Here's the grid again. Here's the adiabatic wall. Here's the zero degrees, 100 degrees, 100 degrees. same heat transfer that goes out the zero degree face should equal the heat transfer that comes in the 100 degree face. Conservation of energy. Chapter 1. Any storage? No. Any generation? No. Conclusion? Q dot N, E dot N equal E dot out. So all the heat that comes in from the 100 degree face should go out the left hand side. We just found out an estimate of how much goes out the left hand side. Now let's find out how much heat goes from the top into it and the right-hand side into it. <coughs> Q into the body from the 100-degree face. Look at the heat conducting rods. Connect them together here from the 100 inside there. From the 100 inside. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one down here. By the way, don't think because that's an adiabatic ball that no heat flows from 11 to 10. Because I'll tell you, that temperature there is 100. That temperature there is zero. That temperature there is 51.6. Definitely, there's heat transfer from 51.6 to zero. Oh yeah, there's heat transfer. There's no heat transfer normal to that direction. No, he's not transferred down that way, but he's transferred along the wall. Okay, same as before. Q, hot temperature T2, cold temperature T5, 2 to 5, uh, 6 to 5, uh, 9 to 8 of Q. Uh, 12 to 11. Okay, let's put them in again. Okay. The heat conducting rod from 2 to 5 replaces what material? It replaces this material. What's the cross-sectional area? Heat goes through my hand, delta x times 1. What's the temperature difference? Hot to cold. Divided by how far did heat move? Delta y. Keep going. 6 to 5. Keep going. Nine to eight. Keep going, but watch out because now the area is half again. Half delta y over two. Simplify it. Square grid. You know the temperatures. You've stopped them already. Put the temperatures in. That's an estimate of how much heat 
goes out, comes in from the 100 degree face. Theoretically, they shouldn't be the same, conservation of energy. But they're not, of course, because this is a really coarse grid model. This is a really coarse grid model. Those two numbers won't match up. So one way to do it then is to take Q average. Q0 plus Q100 divided by 2. Typical way to handle that. Okay, um, you say, well, can we make it better? Well, of course you can. Let's have the grid size. Have the grid size. Delta x now is half O delta x. Delta y is half O delta y. So now you've got nodes here, 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 here. Up here, you're ignoring this whole area. You're ignoring it. If you make it half grid size, now you're ignoring that little piece. Have it again, you're ignoring a little piece up here. As you make the grid size finer and finer, you're going to eliminate that gray area. Over here, where's the gray area? Did I account for this from 100 here? No. Did I account for this 100 degrees here? No. As I make the grid size smaller, finer and finer, this piece up here gets smaller and smaller until it's almost negligible. Then, this will approach this. In the limit, as the grid size approaches infinitely small, sounds like calculus, but delta x goes to zero, delta y goes to zero, you got it. Then you're going to find out, if you wait long enough, that they will be the same. But, you know, that's too much time. So anyway, that's what you're going to do in part B of your problem here. Okay, I'll tell you what it is here. If you've got a fin, the heat that comes into here by conduction through the base, all the heat that comes into the base by conduction goes into the fin, all that heat is carried out by convection. All the heat that comes through the base is carried out by convection. So you're going to find, first of all, Q base equal... You're going to find out Q convection like that. And then you're going to average them. Because they won't be equal because the grid size is not very fine. So if you want to find out how much heat goes in the base, I'll draw the heat conducting rod for you. There are the heat conducting rods, Q, 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 those three right there. Theoretically, that should be equal to the amount of heat lost by convection. It won't be because it's too coarse a grid again. To find the heat lost by convection, you take that area right there, and you take that temperature right there, and you take that temperature right there, and you apply Newton's law of cooling. Q from here to here equal H times the temperature of that node minus T infinity. And do it for every node that's touching air around the perimeter of the fin. And that will give you Q convection. Go around the fin. The top surface, the bottom surface, and here over here. Okay. And that gives you an estimate of how much heat's lost by convection. Then you add them to get your final answer for part D of the special problem. Okay, any questions on that one? We've got a week to do it. It's due next Wednesday. Okay. So, good stopping point. I think we'll stop today and get the exams back on.